Okay, here we go with uh, AS Physics from SIA, Unit 1, from 2022. That's only been recently released. Let's go. Okay, so every uh, physical quantity consists of two parts. What are the two parts? So this is straight out of your notes. We, everything has to have a magnitude, some number representing it, and it also has to have some kind of unit what it's measured in. So then they uh, had some stuff about the SI system of units and the idea that we have what we call base units and derived units. So the idea is that for each one of these quantities you state its unit and then whether or not it's a base or derived unit. Now if you know your again your SI base units then you will know that time uh, is measured in seconds and it, it is one of those SI base units. So we say that time is measured in seconds and the base unit, or that it is, sorry, a base unit. And you might want to write the whole word seconds there um, just in case. And then we have length and again length is one of the base units. Uh, its unit is the meter and uh, it's not derived, it's a base unit. Just move that up a little bit and force we know is measured in newtons and we know that it is not a base unit, it's actually a derived unit. It's not one of the SI base units. Kinetic energy, well all energy we know is measured in joules and again, it is a derived unit. Uh, amount of substance, that is one of the SI base units and it's measured in moles. And charge, uh, we know that that's measured in coulombs, but we know that it's not one of the list of SI base units, it's a derived unit. Part C then, the unit of potential difference is the volt. Express the volt in base units. Okay, so we need an equation that has the volt in it. And uh, W equals QV is probably the best one to start with there. So we've got like the electrical energy uh, transferred to other forms when a charge passes across a voltage. W, the work, is equal to Q times V. And W can be thought of as like the loss of potent gravity of electric potential energy um, of that charge as it crosses that voltage. So W equals QV is a standard electrical equation that we know and uh, we can think of work as like you know force times distance. We can think of charge as like uh, Q equals IT. So if we get a relationship for V here and then sub in for W and Q that's basically the way to tackle this. So again we can say to ourselves that V would be W over Q and that work can be thought of as force times distance. Force can be thought as F equals MA so we can get M times A times distance. Once we get to that stage we can start to put base units in um, and Q equals IT. So V can be thought of as the top line work simplifies to mass times acceleration times distance and the bottom line simplifies to I times T then we can start to put in, well, mass on the top line, that means we've got a kilograms. Uh, acceleration, we've got like meters per second squared. Distance, we've got some more meters. And then I on the bottom line, which means we've got our amps to the minus one, and we've got a time to the minus one. So when we start putting those all in, again, as I say, we've got mass, which means we get a kilogram. Acceleration, which means we get meters per second squared distance which means we get another meter i on the bottom line which means we get an amps to the minus one and t on the bottom line means we get a second to the minus one and now we gather terms you can see here we've got a second to the minus two second to the minus one so there's going to be a second to the minus three in total there's going to be meters times meters so we've got meters squared this kilogram stays as it is this amp stays as it is and that leaves us then with kilogram meter squared seconds to the minus three amp to the minus one. 
Um, part 2A, we're told that a canoeist needs to cross a river from the boathouse on the north side of the river to a jetty on the bank directly opposite. And in order to accomplish this, um, he must maintain a heading at an angle of theta to the bank. The canoeist can paddle at 1.8 meters per second in still water, uh, but this river is flowing due east at uh, 0.7 meters per second. And so the idea is that because the river is heading sort of this way, then the canoeist has to travel out into the river so that the idea of the velocity of the boat plus the velocity of the river gives us a resultant that takes them straight across. And that's really what we want to represent. So the water's moving like this, the boat is moving like this, and the actual com combination of these two motions is that you go straight across to the other side. And that's what we want to represent in our um, diagram. So they ask us to put together a vector diagram. And so we've got this idea that we have a boat that's heading along this direction. That's then added to the movement of the water. And the resultant is the sum of those two, which is motion straight across the river. And now that we've constructed this, we can see that uh, because this is straight across, and the water's doing that, we've got a right angle here, so this forms a right angle triangle. Now it says uh, uh, we have to put the velocity of the river in as VR, so you label that, and we put the velocity of the boat in as VC, I think V for canoe, um, so I probably should have called it the canoe, um, and then V, big V, is like the combination of these, it's the resultant of adding these two vectors together. So we're asked to calculate the angle theta, and that means going back to looking at our triangle of velocities that we had here, okay? So we had this little triangle over here with the 1.8 that the canoe can do, the 0.7 that the river is doing, and when we add those two behaviours, we get this resultant velocity, big V. Now the thing is that uh, theta here, if it's the angle to the bank up here, it's also the angle here because this this vector here is parallel to the bank. So therefore you get like that sort of zigzag uh, rule that you get in maths when you've got a line running between two parallel lines. So the angle up here will also be the angle down here. And so theta uh, drops into our little um, triangle of uh, velocities. And we can see here that, that this thing here is the hypotenuse, this thing here is the adjacent. So the cause of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So the cause of our theta is going to be 0 0.7 over 1.8. And that means then if we take cos to minus 1 of 0 0.7 over 0 0.8, we can get the value of theta. Okay, and we get 67 degrees for that. So now they want us to calculate the time it takes for the canoe to cross the river and arrive at the jetty. So we effectively need to look at the value of big V and uh, the distance across the river. So we need a wee diagram for that and then we want to do uh, time is distance over speed calculation for that because it's going to be a steady speed crossing a known distance. So let's draw a diagram. So we've got a V at 1.8 sine 67. That's going to be the, the velocity straight across there because uh, uh, the sine is going to be the hypotenuse um, opposite over hypotenuse. So uh, the hypotenuse times the sine of 67 is going to give us that opposite. Uh, part of our triangle. So the big V is going to be 1.8 times the sine of 67 and then that's used to cross this 500 meter gap. It says it's half a kilometer across so 500 meters. So we just do that speed is distance over time and that means that we can say that time is distance over speed. 500 is how far we have to go. This component here, this sort of value from our triangle is the value of big V. And so when you divide those, you'll get how long that takes. And we find that it takes about 302 seconds. Now, there's a slight discrepancy here with the mark scheme, but it's basically just uh, uh, SIA or rounding up 
and then that rounding up is compounding itself as they go along and they're getting um, different answers to me. Um, I've rounded up less because I'm keeping all the original numbers and so I don't get that problem. Calculate then the kinetic energy of the canoe as Danny's canoe. If he has a mass of 73 kilograms and his canoe has a mass of 20 kilograms. Okay, so kinetic energy is half mv squared. We need to add these two masses to get the total mass and then we use that with the velocity uh, to get the kinetic energy. So we want to say, right, well, firstly, kinetic energy is half mv squared. We also want to say, well, that 73 plus 20 is the mass, therefore it's 93 kilograms. So we go a half times 93, which is the total mass, times the big V velocity squared. Okay, so we said the big V was 1.8 sine 67. And then we're squaring that. And that gives us 128 joules. And again, the mark scheme doesn't quite agree with me, but again, that's because SIA are using values from earlier on that they rounded up. Three A, we're asked to state the principle of moments, and uh, there's three marks for this, and that's because there's more to it than just saying it was a total clockwise moment equals a total anti-clockwise moment. Um, firstly, there's a specific detail about the clockwise moment and the anti-clockwise moment. They have to be about the exact same point. And secondly, clockwise moment only equals anti-clockwise moment while the object is in equilibrium. So you start with the conditions that are required. So when an object is in equilibrium, then we find that the total clockwise moment about a point equals the total anti-clockwise moment about that same point. So, has to be equilibrium. Then, if we look at the moments about a, a, the same point, we should find that the total clockwise moment about that point equals the total anti-clockwise moment. Some people call it the, the sum of the clockwise moments equals the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. It's up to yourself. Okay, so they're talking about this little mobile, and I've put some values onto it from what they've said. Just the idea that um, we have this thing here and uh, it hangs from a cord at C and it says it consists of a uniform plastic rod AB um, which is length 45 centimeters so this rod here is length 45 centimeters and it says that the rod has a weight and that will happen at the middle of this which is going to be 22 and a half centimeters in the middle of this rod is where its weight will act remember that's the rules about center of gravity it's where we can imagine that the weight of an object acts so your knowledge of center of gravity comes into this uh, and we say right well if, if they tell me the weight of that and it's a uniform thing uniform means it's its mass is evenly distributed and therefore its center of gravity will be in the middle therefore when they tell us it's 45 centimeters long we know that we can put its weight acting from its center so it says as well that the two objects that are attached, the star has a weight of 0.2 newtons and the crescent moon here has a weight of 0.4 newtons. Okay, and they've got 0.20 and 0.40, but I haven't bothered with that. But, you know, we need to think about that um, in our significant figures. You know, everything's quoted here to two significant figures. So that's what they tell us about it. So as with all such problems, you want to get yourself a diagram. We've already done one, but I've had to move it forward here to help us with this problem. And they want us to determine how far from A the string is attached. So basically how far from A is point C there. So I've marked that on my diagram as D, how far it is from point A to point C, because that's what they want us to find. Um, and then we're meant to do uh, some kind of moments problem. You can see... Uh, we've got a total force acting down of 0 0.2, 0 0.5 and 0.4. So they add to 1.1, which means that that must be also the upward force. So you can sort of say upward forces equal downward forces. You know, it's not it's in, not in translational um, motion. It's in, it's in equilibrium vertically. 
Therefore, the total upward force equals the total downward force. Therefore, the force at C has to be upward, and it has to be the sum of all these downward forces. Okay. So we could now take moments about A, make A the pivot, and take moments about A. And uh, so we've got, like, this one doesn't come into that because its distance from the pivot is zero. This one, we know it's 22 and a half from A. C here, we don't know, but we can call it D in the meantime. And the force downward at B, we know, is 45 centimeters away from A. So we construct um, a little uh, moments problem about that. We say that the clockwise moment about A has to equal the total anti-clockwise moment about um, A. Uh, and therefore, the thing that's trying to turn it anti-clockwise here um, is this upward force at C. So that times its distance from the pivot equals... 0.5 times 22 and a half and added to 0.4 times 45 and that's that's us basically constructing you know these two here that one and that one are both trying to turn it clockwise c here is trying to turn anti-clockwise and the force of the star doesn't participate in moments about a because its distance from the pivot is nothing okay so we want to say that 1.1 times d that's the thing trying to turn it anti-clockwise, equals uh, this thing, 0. 0.5 times 22 and a half, added to 0. 0.4 times 45, and that, that is, those are all the moments, and they are in equilibrium. So uh, what I did here was that I multiplied the whole equation by 10, because that means we can call this 11 instead of 1.1d. We can call this 5 times 22.5 and we can call this 4 times 45 and if you do that you get a simplified version of what we've got. We get 11d equals uh, 5 22 and a half, which is 112.5 and 4 45 which is 180 so 11d equals the sum of those two and then that means that d is the sum of those two over 11 so we divide that by 11 and get a value then for D. And D turns out to be 26.6 centimetres. So the important thing to remember with these kind of problems is that you have to look at this carefully, look at what they've told you. Now it'd be very easy to forget to put the weight of the, the rod on or to forget about the idea of a uniform object, the centre of gravity is going to be in the middle, and therefore where we can put it is exactly 22.5 centimetres from A. So those are the things, that's where your sort of knowledge um, starts to build up, where you, you know this fact about what a uniform object means, you know the fact about what um, centre of gravity, is, how you can use it to identify where the weight can be drawn on the diagram, that kind of thing, this is where it all comes together. So just knowing those facts in isolation is no good if you can't make use of them. Another star is hung from point C. State and explain whether the mobile would remain in a horizontal position or tilt. And the important thing to realise there is that C is the cord that it's hanging from. So anything hanging from there will result in um, it's it not being... Uh, out of equilibrium because anything hanging from C here is acting through the pivot and therefore its distance to that pivot is zero and therefore it cannot create a moment about C therefore it cannot tip so if we hang something directly under this it won't affect the balance of this because its distance from the pivot is zero They really want us to say whether or not it will remain horizontal. Mm -hmm. And so the idea here is that we just explain that, yes, that it would stay horizontal. And then we can sort of explain what's going on, that forces acting through C create no moment about C because their distance to the pivot is zero. Question four, archer fish prey on land-based insects. Uh, their excellent eyesight and ability to compensate for the refraction of light as it passes through an air-water boundary allows them to target their prey successfully. Uh, they project water from their mouths and knock insects from branches above the surface of the water. The insects then fall into the water and are eaten 
by the archer fish and so this is demonstrated in this little diagram where it does we squirt up here knocks this wee bug off and then down here it'll swim along and catch it So they're presenting us a sort of a projectiles problem here. Archer fish typically project water from the surface with a velocity of 2.52 meters per second and an angle of 74 degrees to the horizontal as indicated in figure 4.2. And so you, you probably realize that the water goes up, does a wee loop round, hits this bug and then it arrives down here somewhere and gets eaten. Calculate the horizontal and vertical components of the initial velocity. So all they're doing is asking us to break this 2.52 meters per second into a horizontal component and a vertical component. And so, uh, you know, you've got a horizontal component, which is going to be um, uh, 2.52 times the cos of 74 and a vertical component that's going to be 2.52 times the sine. Of 74 because uh, the vertical component is opposite to the angle and that means it's the sine and the horizontal component is adjacent to the angle and that means it's the cause so again just simply um, u horizontal 2.52 cause 74 u vertical 2.52 uh, sine 74 and you get these values of 0.69 and 2.42 so very straightforward u sine theta, u cos theta, giving you the, the two components that we're after. So they do mention in the question that they ask that we're interested in the maximum height s that the insect could be above the surface uh, um, that the water from the archer fish would be able to reach. And so the idea here is that we put together a UVAST list of um, the values that we're after. Um, And 2.42 there was the vertical component, and that's the, the component that we're after. Uh, as this thing rises, its vertical velocity will eventually peter out to nothing. When it, it's moving horizontally here, its vertical velocity will be nothing. So at the highest point, uh, V vertical will be zero. We've got G acting down, so we've got minus 9.81. Remember, we were taking this upward velocity to be positive, so we have to take this downward G to be negative. Uh, it'll go up a displacement s, and we don't know how long that'll take. So we want to find this s, and so we need an equation that has these things in it, but doesn't require us to also know t. And so if you look at your equations of motion, you'll realize that that would have to be this one. v squared is u squared plus 2as. Get s on its own is going to be v squared minus u squared all divided by 2a. And if we sub into that, we've got naught squared minus 2.42 squared over 2 times negative 9.81. And so we've got a top line negative over a bottom line negative, so we should end up with a positive value for S. And we do. And there may be a discrepancy here with the mark scheme, but again, that's um, different rounding positions between Sia and myself. And so to two significant figures, we can call that 0 0.30 of a meter. Uh, it says, I calculate the time it takes. So now we use the same UVAS list to work on the time. And the idea there is that that's going to be uh, V equals U plus AT. So T is going to be V minus U over A. And if we sub into that, we get T equal to not minus 2.42 over negative 9.81 giving us 0.246 of a second which we can round to two significant figures as 0.25 of a second so that's the time to reach the highest point and that's important because in the second part they ask about the falling uh, bug and uh, you know the time to reach this highest point will also be the time to fall back down from the highest point. And so the time on the returning journey is also going to be 0.25 of a second. So the first thing they ask us to define is um, impulse. And again, we can say that impulse is simply the product 
of the force acting and the time that it acts for. Uh, then they want us to calculate the mass of the insect. So we need to look at what they've said here about the problem. So they said the projected water hits uh, the stationary insect at a maximum height s. So the insect is knocked off the branch with a velocity of 1.25 meters per second in the horizontal direction. So we know it goes horizontally initially. So it doesn't have any vertical motion at the start when it's first knocked off. Uh, the horizontal impulse experienced by the insect due to the force from the water is 6.25 times 10 to the 5 newton seconds. Um, so the idea, yeah, that we remind ourselves that the um, impulse is the product of the force acting and the time that that force acts for. So what we need to do is, is put like uh, FT, the impulse equal to change momentum, which is standard equation that we're meant to think about. So when we calculate the mass of the insect, we're looking then at that particular relationship. So impulse is F times T. Change of momentum is mv minus mu, and we can sub into that, and that will help us to get m. So uh, mv is the final um, momentum after the collision, and we're told that it leaves the branch with a velocity of 1.25 meter per second, so we know that the mass of the thing times 1.25 is its final momentum. But since it wasn't moving to start, its initial momentum over here is m times nothing. So this simplifies the problem here. We've got our 6.25 times 10 to the minus 5 equal to m times 1.25. So we literally get m by dividing that 6.25 times 10 to the minus 5 by the 1.25. So m equals that divided by that, which gives us 5 times 10 to the minus 5 kilograms and they want it in milligrams okay so if we were to multiply that by a thousand that would take it to grams and if we were to multiply that by a thousand again we would take it to milligrams and so it works out at 50 milligrams So we're further told that when the insect falls and hits the water, it lands at a distance x from the point where the water was projected by the archerfish. And so we've got this idea that x is the distance between the little shot up and the bug falling back down. And I've broken that into x1 and x2, you know, meaning the, the motion of the water on the way up and then the motion of the bug on the way down. Because they ask us here to calculate the distance x. Assume that, that uh, friction due to air resistance can be um, ignored basically as negligible. So what I started with here was the idea that the time to rise to the highest point will equal the time for the bug to fall because that doesn't that behavior doesn't depend on the mass of the object. Um, it would do if we were to include air resistance um, because the behaviors would be slightly different if we included air resistance um, but we're not doing that and therefore everything will fall and rise at the same rate just due to the behavior of g acting in the problem so the time to rise to that point will be the same as the time to fall which means that t1 equals t2 which equals 0.25 of a second and so x1 will simply be um, the original horizontal motion the horizontal velocity of the uh, jet of water times the 0.25 uh, that it took to get up to the highest point. So this velocity this way times the 0.25 it takes to get there. And then this x2 will be this 1.25 times the, um, the 0.25 it'll take for it to fall again. So remember these two times, the time to rise to this point, the time to come back down uh, will both be 0.25 seconds because it's going to be a symmetrical problem. The time to, time to go up to a certain height under gravity will equal the time to come back down from that height under gravity. And so we did find that the horizontal motion here was 0.69. And if we multiply that by 0.25, we'll get the first x. And if we multiply this 1.25 by the 
point uh, two five of a second that it's falling for, we'll get the second x. So we basically just have two expressions for x1 and x2. So on the way up, it's traveling at this speed and it takes this amount of time to reach the top. On the way down, it's traveling at this speed sideways and it takes the same amount of time to come back down. And so x is going to be the sum of x1 plus x2, so we just basically need to add those together. And uh, I got 0.485, and they want it, you know, obviously because our original numbers are to 2SF, we need to finish off to 2SF, so I put it down as 0.49. And again, if you have different rounding, or you round before you add those, etc., 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 you're going to get a slightly different answer, maybe. Collisions can be described as elastic or inelastic. Explain without calculation why the collision that occurs when the insect hits the surface of the water is inelastic. Okay, so it, its kinetic energy is not conserved uh, in that collision uh, because it will splodge into the water, end up with no velocity, and there'll be like sound and possibly some heat generated and a uh, uh, water wave travelling off possibly from it. Um, but basically, its kinetic energy is not going to be conserved, so it will be inelastic. Question 5 then. Pilots of high-speed jet aircraft must learn to land a plane on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier, uh, which are much shorter than land-based runways. A successful landing is achieved by snagging a tail hook attached to the rear of the plane uh, uh, to a sturdy cable uh, as an arresting wire. And the arresting wire can stop uh, a 24.5 times 10 to the 3 kilogram aircraft uh, travelling at 150 miles per hour. And it can stop it in 2.5 seconds from that amount of uh, momentum. Okay, show that 150 miles per hour is equivalent to 67 meters per second, and you know how you do this. 150 miles per hour is 150 miles in an hour. You know, the, the, the speed calculation would be like 150 miles on the top line, and a time of one hour on the bottom line gives you 150 per hour. Uh, and then we just convert the top line and the bottom line into meters and seconds, and that'll give you the conversion that you're after, okay? So what we do is we say speed distance over time. They started off with it being 150 miles in an hour. Well, what we do is we change the top line using that conversion they've given us. They've given us a wee conversion here that a mile is 1609 meters. So 150 times 1609 means the top line's nine meters. 60 times 60, because there's 60 minutes and they all contain 60 seconds. Uh, and that means that the, the top line is the same distance, but 9 metres. The bottom line is the same time, but 9 seconds. When we divide those, we will get metres per second. And when we divide those, we get 67.04, which is what they've asked us to find. You know, to, to 3SF, it's 67.04. Um, assume that the jet decelerates uniformly during the 2.85 seconds that it takes to land. Sketch a velocity time graph on the axes, figure 5.1, for this jet landing and include numerical value on each axis. So we know that it starts at 67 uh, metres per second and we know that 2.85 seconds later its velocity is nothing. So we want a straight line going from 67 to zero and it takes 2.85 seconds for that to happen so we give ourselves a straight line and then we put numbers on the two axes so we need a starting velocity of 67 and we need a finishing time of 2.85 seconds so it's linear so we draw, draw it straight we know we start at 67 meters per second and we know that by 2.85 our velocity is nothing. 
State how you would determine the distance travelled by the jet during its deceleration from the velocity time graph. Well, we, we know that the displacement from a velocity time graph is the area under the graph. So it's the area of that triangle. Uh, you know, and if you want to shade it and then say... Okay, so the area under that graph will be the total displacement and that's going to be how far the thing has gone as it was being slowed down. So, there are four parallel arresting wires spaced 15 metres apart on the flight deck. Pilots train to snag the third arresting wire as it is the safest option to land. The flight deck of the aircraft carrier is 150 metres long. Use your answer to A to calculate how far from the end of the flight deck the jet is when it comes to a standstill. If the pilot is successful in snagging the third wire. Okay, so how far it is when it stops if the pilot is successful in snagging the third wire. So I think we have to assume, oh right, so it does say that. Assume that the first arresting wire is 15 metres from the start of the flight deck. Okay, so we need a diagram. Okay, so let us try and see what happens here. So we've got the edge of the, the flight deck. The first wire is 15 metres in. The second wire is another 15 metres in. The third wire is 15 metres in. So the third wire is 45 metres in. Then the wire slows the thing down. And we can get this distance from the graph. That's why they were just asking about it. Um, and so we then want to know what the total distance is. And the total distance is going to be 45 metres plus D. So we need to look at that little uh, graph again. And so we'll just sketch a version of it here to help us. So D is going to be the area of this, which is going to be the area of a triangle. So it's uh, 67 tall. A half times the base times the height should give us what we're after. So a half times 2.85 times 67. And that gives us 95.5 metres to three significant figures. And then we add the 45 that it had already got by the time it arrived there. Because remember... It had already done 45 metres and then D is another 95 and a half. So you add those two together. Okay, now I nearly completely missed the fact that they want to know how far it is from the end of the flight deck. Okay. Um, so in other words, how far it is from the other end. Okay, so we need to take the fact that it's 150 long and subtract what we've got this total from that. So I've added that information that it's 150 to the end of the flight deck and you can see here that we've got um, 45 plus 95 and a half. So if we look specifically then at how far we are from the end, I've just called it D2, then D2 is going to be the 150, the total length of the flight deck minus how much distance the plane has used up so it turns out to be nine and a half meters from the end of the flight deck by the time it stops if that's the case i'm not really sure what the fourth string or the fourth chord is for because it would be right off the flight deck if it put another 15 meters on that some jets can land vertically on aircraft carriers. They are able to fly slowly, hover and land in tight spaces. Hovering is achieved by directing powerful exhaust streams downwards from the jet engines. State Newton's third law and explain how it applies to a jet which is hovering. So when two objects exert forces on each other, what we want to say is that you know the force that the first one exerts on the second is equal and opposite to the force that the second exerts on the first. So it's easier to call them A and B. So just formalizing that, the force A exerts on B is equal and opposite to the force B exerts on A. Now how does this uh, 
apply to the jet hovering. So you've got two things here. You've got the um, hot air that's being th thrust downward by the jets and you've got the plane being pushed upwards. So that those are A and B. The air being thrust downwards um, is being pushed with a downward force but the equal and opposite force then is that the air itself exerts an equal and opposite force upward on the plane. So again, as with all of these things, you've got two objects. You've got the air being thrown downwards and the plane being pushed upwards. So that becomes your A and your B. So that's all the mechanical um, questions. I'm going to leave it there and maybe come back with a part B. Okay, thanks for watching.